What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. What's up? On The Stack, we talk pizza. about... Pizza! And on The Stack, we talk about pizza and also comic books. Let's kick it off with a bunch of new ones here, starting with Fantastic Four. Number one from Marvel, written by Ryan North, art by Ivan Coelho. So this is, of course, as you can tell by the number, a new run on Fantastic Four, picking up after Dan Slott's story run on the title. In this issue, we're following The Thing and Alicia Masters as they go outside of New York and get stuck in a town that is itself stuck in a time loop takes a creative bent on that and then has some big reveals about what is going on in this title after that. What did you guys think about this first issue? Well, I'm not a huge uh, Fantastic Four fan, so I was kind of like, what's this going to be? But I was pleasantly surprised. This was such a great story. I love these two together, so it was really great to kind of see this and Ben's uh, very much adorable uh, when he's with her. So, yeah, I I just felt like this was uh, such a great start, such a cool uh, start that I would not have guessed in a million years that they would start a new run with this idea. Uh, Yeah, I agree with that, actually. I I really like Ryan North. I think um, he comes to comics with uh, sort of a sharp uh, take. Like, it's always something that feels like, you know what, I'm going to do something a little bit different as opposed to just jumping in with um, your classic Fantastic Four story. And uh, this very much works for me. It felt like almost a cold open to um, uh, the run where we get just Thing and Alicia dealing with a Groundhog Day situation. Um, Hey, can uh, you... Can you not use like line producer or lingo because it really? I what what do you mean when you say cold open? You know what I mean? cold open. You know oh. when you open the freezer and you're like, ooh, ooh, ooh that's a cold yeah. open. Okay. Yeah. So and to talk okay. further okay. about line producer or lingo, what would you say a Groundhog Day situation is? Uh, the movie <laughs> Groundhog Day, um, where in where, in which just corner oh, of your great. eye, you're, just corner you're, of your eye. Yeah, <laughs> where um, the main character, uh, played by Bill Murray, um, mm-hmm. has to live the same day over and over again until okay. Okay. he finally breaks the cycle in a way that I won't spoil, spoil, but is a very excellent movie. Um, and this is very in in a similar fashion. Yes, I was most struck by this feeling a lot like The Twilight Zone, but maybe a little more positive, starring The Thing, like you guys are saying. Very surprising to have a new run on Fantastic Four that does not start with the Fantastic Four, but just starts with The Thing. But I love a good Thing story. They're great. Uh, The Thing title back in the day was one of my favorite things. Uh, And I've enjoyed several. Sorry, I got stuck. But yeah. I, I think this is another really good thing story. It seems like we're going to be getting a Mr. Fantastic and Invisible Woman story next issue. I assume we'll get Johnny Storm after that. Spoilers here. This is the one thing that makes me a little hesitant about this. I love the idea of weird science fiction stories focusing on different members of the Fantastic Four in different iterations. That would be great. I would read that forever. But the reveal at the end here is the reason the thing and Alicia Masters are outside New York was the Fantastic Four did something that created a big crater in the middle of New York. Inherently, I like that as a concept, and I think that's interesting, except that is the same thing that they're doing over in Amazing Spider-Man right now, where Amazing Spider-Man also started off... Also too soon. Right. Also the whole, yeah, 9-11 thing, I guess. There's that as well. Not too soon. That as well, but mostly, mostly Amazing Spider-Man, where it started off with Peter Parker in the middle of the crater, screaming at the heavens, and then it cuts, I think, six months later, and everybody hates him. Here, we have the Fantastic Four did something that created a big crater, and everybody hates them. So it feels a little repetitive there. I'm sure they'll go in different directions, but having that Maybe same same crater. Yeah, I hope it's the same crater. crater. Could be Spider Man. It just could uh, probably be a, a sail on craters, you know? Well, like, wow, sail on craters? Uh, I uh, I hear you on that. Um, and I, but what I, I guess what I like about this the most is that the thing is sort of the heart of the Fantastic Four. Um, the definitely the character that you're like, you're really feeling for no matter what's happening. So to come in on the thing, especially happily happy in his relationship is really cool. Then to move to the more marquee, like, uh, Reed and Sue story uh, is very don't cool. Don't start and, with the more marquee. That's come on, man. 
I mean, they're the most Fantastic Four stories focus on Reed, or Reed is uh, the solution to it. Again, yeah, I know he's in the background being like, oh boy, Human Torch, I'm going to crack this beer and punch you in the head. Yeah, they're playing pranks. They're pranksters. Mm-hmm. And occasionally marrying scrolls and stuff. But <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's it. So like the Just inn is you cool. haven't done it. You know what I mean? Married a scroll? Yeah. No, my wife is a scroll. I, Ooh, I have said this that. is a and, review reveal. Yeah. Well, she hasn't said it. She hasn't revealed it yet. But I think she, I'm pretty sure she's up to something. <laughs> Why don't we move on and talk about the next book yeah, in the stack let's... here. The New Golden Age, number one from DC Comics, written by Jeff Johns, art by Diego Olatugo with J.P. Meyer and Scott Hanna, Jerry Ordway, Steve Lieber, Todd Nock, Scott Collins, Victor Bogdovich, Brandon Peterson and Gary Frank. And this is doing a bunch of things here. The main thing that it's doing yes. is setting up a new Justice Society story that Jeff Johns is going to be telling. It also spins into a new Stargirl book, and it also spins off of the Flashpoint Beyond story that he was just telling. I'll tell you what, and this is going to get into spoilers again, so just to mention for the end of the book, I was with this for like, I don't know. I don't remember how many. You're going to say the same thing that, but like 20 of the 22 pages where this is essentially a story of per Dagaton. They don't say who it is, but it's very clearly per Dagaton. who's like this very classic justice society villain going throughout time and being like, I'm going to kill the justice society throughout time. That is my goal. And in classic per Dagaton fashion, like he's just an evil asshole. That's pretty much all he is. He hates the Justice Society. And I love that being just like a basic motivation of just classic villain, classic setup. Very reverse flash, other Jeff Johns stuff, like spot on. Great. And then Uh, in the last couple of pages, it starts getting into all this shit that they dealt with at the end of Flashpoint Beyond with like, and now we're setting up these lost children and here's the Time Masters and oh, there's a baby Dr. Manhattan maybe and all of these other things that I'm like, no, 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 too complicated, too much going on here. Gary Frank's art as usual is beautiful on this, all of this Watchmen stuff, but stop, just focus on the one story you have because it's so good already. A hundred percent. I felt the same. As soon as we got into the Watchmen stuff, I was like, oh, no, not all that stuff, dude, again, like, and it felt it, it felt because I was I think feel like the, I felt like the story was really cresting. And the fact that they, they looped in a lot of the um, bat cat stuff that Tom King's been doing and, and getting into all that, that felt like, oh, yeah, scooping up some of uh, the current popular DC stuff. Great. And then when it got to the the flashpoint stuff with uh all those characters i was like ah it just feels like too much it also felt like afterthought to a lot of the mm-hmm. other more interesting story points that were established and there was just like quick hits on all these other flashpoint characters i was like i i thought i think the larger thing if this had been marketed or, or told to us as like the continuation of that maybe i'd feel differently but it definitely felt like a new story from Jeff Johns that I was like really on board. Dr. Fate, Justice Society, very Jeff Johns uh, playground to play in. And then we we tacked that on and I got a little lost, but I am going to continue with this because mm-hmm. I do like the main thrust of the story. Um, I hated this. Uh, there were wow. some amazing covers, uh, but it was such a creepy start. It looks like a Joker type of villain who's like watching a little girl and it just creeped me out. Uh, so much and then started time jumping and then it got really confusing and i was just like fuck this i I needed a drink after reading this i was so creeped out by the uh evil dude watching children that it it was a little too triggering for me and i was just like i I don't want to have anything to do with this for people who don't know per dagaton he is creepy. He's essentially just a time traveling Nazi. Like that's uh, basically like he's not explicitly a Nazi, I don't think, but he dresses like one and he just hates the Justice Society. That's his whole motivation. He just wants to destroy them. And I there was a funny bit and this was probably totally intentional, but Pete's pointing out this point when he's looking through the window at Helena Wade and it looks like the ha ha sickos thing from the onion that gets passed around a lot on the internet which was very funny to me. But at the same time, like, 
I, like Justin saying, and then we can kind of move on to something else. I did really feel like this Helena Wayne stuff was great and really emotional. I thought the Dr. Fate stuff was great. There's a page. I wish I knew which of the many artists drew this one, but where Dr. Fate is just continually dying in this very MC Escher style background. And you just see all the deaths of Dr. Fate. I thought that was very cool. So to be clear, even though I was yeah. very frustrated with the last couple of pages, I still think this is worth picking up. I'm very excited about the Justice Society series. I'm excited about the DC Stargirl series. Um, all of that stuff, I think, is going to be good. Why don't we move on and talk about Gospel Number One from Image Comics by Will Morris. We had Will Morris on our live show. Yes, Pete, he did talk about Gospel in the interview. This nah. is a story about stories as one woman back in the Middle Ages tries to build her reputation as a monster hunter while we deal with several iterations of that very story before things go wrong at the end. As we talked about in the live show, I thought this was a lovely story that was beautifully told. Justin, I thought you had a great take on it in terms of fables and everything. Do you want to reiterate that here? I will. Um, so this is, Will Morris does the um, writing and art on this book. Um, and the if you're a fan of the comic book fables, you will, the, um, the Willingham Buckingham continuum um, coming together in one man, Will Morris, who, who writes and draws this book that has a lot of the bones of fables, but it's the, the new take here is it's about, um, there's some biblical undertones here. The devil is the villain. So it's not, it's fables meets Bibles. It's Bibles. <laughs> or Babels. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I, I agree. This is really, uh, really fantastic. The art's uh, really absolutely beautiful. Has this uh, very old-timey feel in such a nice way. I I, I was really impressed by the, the, the writing. The story here is very cool. It's also this interesting kind of meta take about storytelling in a comic about storytelling I, I appreciate it i think that this is very unique and interesting i'm very curious to see where this goes from here i think as a first issue it does a great job of getting you sucked into this world and kind of like into what's happening and uh yeah uh we talked to him a lot about uh how he's really into devils uh he broke out his devil's book that is very very worn down which i was a little creeped out by but he seems like a very nice guy so hopefully this <laughs> doesn't get too dark and creepy uh but uh yeah just a fantastic first issue a lot of great things going on definitely recommend it Next up, Black Panther Unconquered, number one from Marvel, written by Brian Hill, art by Alberto Fochi. This is a done-in-one story of Black Panther versus, I believe, a new enemy. Pete, you seem stoked about this. Wakanda forever. forever. Oh, boy. Oh, <laughs> Justin Jordan knew what I was Jordan going to the do. whisper chin. Yeah, I've never seen Pete lean into the mic that hard. He knew what I was going to do before. Did, did you like it. this no, comic, Pete? Yes, I did. It was very emotional to read, though, because, uh, you know, the Black Panther is alive in this, uh, which is, a, a, you know, a creative... And in general, Marvel Comics continuity. Yeah, yeah. But it was still emotional to read. Uh, I think this was a great issue. Amazing art. Really a lot of uh, cool stuff happens. Um, I also like the way it kind of uh, starts and ends. It has a nice kind of book ending kind of feel to it, which I really appreciated. Yeah, this is very creative and cool and uh, artistically very well done. Yeah, this um, it feels like it's putting uh, Black Panther on, uh, seems like a, a very clean track of like, well, there's this um, mythology that um, wasn't really known beforehand. We're going to explore that through a series of different uh, weapons, perhaps, where uh, Black Panther's going to fight some stuff. It feels like a very comic booky uh, iteration of Black Panther, which I think is perfect time to do that. Looking forward to reading more of this. My favorite part of the book was, I think it's Iron Man and Mr. Fantastic show up at the end, and they're like, well, we're going to need that stuff back, and Black Panther's like, respectfully, no way, and they're like, okay, back it off. <laughs> and we're just going to step out of this hollow chat, my man, because uh, it seems like we're not going to get to look at this stuff. <laughs> Good stuff. Why don't we move on and talk about the death of Superman 30th anniversary special number one from DC Comics, written by Dan Jurgens, Jerry Ordway, Roger Stern, and Louise Simonson, art by Brett Breeding, Tom Grummet, Butch Juice, 
Butch Juice, Geis, I never know. Geis, I think. Geis. Butch and Juice. Butch Juice. <laughs> <laughs> and John Bogdanov. Do you this need is, some more As you can Butch tell juice? from the title, it is paying a homage to the 30th anniversary of the death of Superman. But what it's doing is it's telling different stories around the death of Superman or inspired by the death of Superman. And I'll tell you what, I was very trepidatious to get into this because I felt like it would be like very old timey. I, I actually thought this was great. I thought this was a really good collection that paid homage to this event in very surprising and mostly really interesting ways. Well, yeah. I mean, the the Dan Jurgens the lead story, sure. which is very much revisiting Superman Doomsday, um, was seeing that Dan Jurgens very stern, serious Superman, like we don't really have that anymore. I feel like Superman is much more of like uh, all heart, like let's go let's be emotional all the time especially a book we're going to talk about later on in this stack which take it fantastic. easy take it yep. take it easy to see this much more like sort of boy scouty uh like strong back spine uh iron spine superman who's like what's happening here it definitely takes you back that 30 year time change to to that doomsday storyline um, but it was fun. It definitely revisits it, revisits it a lot in a way that I didn't quite um, expect, um, having been there for the original read. Uh, it's fun that a trophy basically saves the day. Um, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the uh, the way they covered all of the ancillary characters, though, with the backup stories, the John Henry Iron story, especially. I yeah. thought it was very cool. Yeah, I've I've really thought. Uh, first off, really cool cover. Um... Yeah, I, I feel like they did a great job of integrating the kind of famous comic and uh, through through back to the art style in a way that kind of uh, had a fresher take. And uh, yeah, I, I felt like it, it honored it in a good way, but also brought some fun new stuff to it. Yeah, I feel like this was a Cool Beans-ish. <laughs> Cool beans ish. Excuse me. It's the cool beans ish of the week, according to Pete LePage. We'll see if that holds up by the end when we all make our own cool beans. Uh, everybody at home, keep track these beans and find out if you can spot the coolest of them because we got some cool beans on this one, but they may get even cooler. Pete transitioning from bananas to beans in a shocking turn in the middle of November. Isn't that shocking? I don't know. It's almost the same word. It's very close. Yeah. Let's move on. Talk he about chooses the chaos. <laughs> the Knight and the Lady of Play, number one from Image Comics by Jonathan Luna. This is a one shot from one half of the Luna brothers who are off doing their own thing at this point. Luna. This is a medieval... <laughs> fairy tale story i guess you would say of a knight who wants her to just wood and Sexy. encounters a very horny witch <laughs> who wants to hold a bunch of i would argue off. the horniest witch <laughs> and what happens off of that uh i'll can i just tell a quick story so this weekend i took oh, my so I encountered this witch. A horny witch. <laughs> i am trapped there right now she will not uh, stop having sex with me i was I took my son to a chess tournament, and the oh way boy. that it works with the chess tournament, my son's eight years old, is that they do four chess How matches over the course. Of real quick, so let me, real quick, before oh. Alex, yeah. before you finish this story, so just to be clear, this story is about a knight who gets trapped by a horny witch and then has to have sex with her and t continues to have sex with her to let his friend survive. And Alex is telling a story about taking his son to a chess tournament. I just wanted to set the table for everyone to know where the fuck our boy Alex Alvin's going. Right yes. Hit it, my dog. So normally I take like, I slowly read our comics for the stack over like uh, Saturdays or Sundays and sometimes into Mondays. So I try to space it out so it doesn't get all jammed up before we're taping the stack, right? So I was like, oh, this is, I'm going to be here for seven hours while my son does this chess matches. So I'm oh mostly going to be sitting around. Uh, but I was still oh worried. No. I was a little worried oh about no. it. But I was like, all right, I'm just going to read the safer comics. And I looked at the cover of this and I was like, oh, no. this looks very medieval and safe. Normal, and this no. is definitely the one yeah. where like I was sitting in the middle the of the Lure Brothers, asshole, you know better. Room, and I was like, click, click, whoop, close the computer there. That's the whole story. There was too much buildup for it, but it was definitely yep. not something I should be reading at an eight-year-old chess tournament with a bunch yeah. of kids around. Uh, well, Alex, I will say the title did have Lady of Play in it, which I mm. feel like I thought like should've... play, like chess. They're playing chess at the time, so it's kind of the same thing. In a way, body chess. Anyway, uh, I'll just say I wanted more out of this story. This really, like, I know we're joking about it, but it really did seem like 
he was like, well, gotta have sex with this witch a bunch more. And I was like, I, I don't know. It didn't really come together as a fable or a story for me in any way, even though I like Jonathan Luna's art in general. I agree. I like Jonathan Luna's art. And um, I also like I like also like this comic. I, I agree. It needed one more sort of fairy tale turn to earn like it's telling, I think, because it was just like it, and this is a spoiler. Um, he's the knight wanders into a swamp and there's a witch there and come to find out all of his buddies from the war they just fought are also like, yeah, sex witch got me too. I'm here. Uh, and then, and then he's like, okay, well I'm going to, he tricks her and his get lets his friends go and he's stuck there. I needed just one more turn mm -hmm. for it to really connect. I feel like, and it almost got there because the idea, the whole story is built around a letter he's writing his wife and daughter. And so he sadly is, is mentally writing this letter that he loves her, even though he's here and the witch is hugging him. Yeah, they have he, sex has to, he has to have <laughs> sex with this witch. I read this and I was like, come on, come on, seriously, uh, a witch in the woods who just wants to have sex with dudes. I mean, this is really, this is, <laughs> well, this is what we're doing that way. I, I don't know. I mean, that's well, what it is. Yeah, to be fair, okay. she's in the swamp, which as we know, our swamps are sexy woods. <laughs> no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with that at all. Very sexy. I would woods. say woods are more sexy than swamps, bro. Really? What, yeah. What's more sexier about woods? Uh, there's no swamp. You don't have to worry about like gators and stuff underneath the Haven't water. Have you ever heard I mean, the old uh, old wives' tale about woods don't give you woods, but swamps you're gonna hump? Nope. No, yeah, that's hump. Not hump. <laughs> I got you. Mean it didn't quite no, work. I don't know I what voice there head. at the end. I'm just uh, at home yeah. humping. Just I, I think at it, home humping. <laughs> swamps are just sort of like a little sweatier. There are a little like uh, there's a heat there. Woods can just be cold and uh, unfriendly. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, great well, book. either Check way, it out. <laughs> I, I, no, it's not. It's not that great. I was reading it and I was just like, "There's not. There's, there should be more to this story. This isn't." Have oh, you guys you checked out the most recent run, Witch Sex? No, I wanted more to the story. Oh, I didn't. Want you wanted more, more regular right. sex. Oh my god! <laughs> I hate you guys. Have hey. you guys read the recent run up from DC Comics on um, sexy woods thing? <laughs> 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 AXE Judgment it's really Day great. <laughs> Omega from Marvel, written by Karen Gillan, art by Gigi Villanova. And this is don't wrapping up. I don't know. This is wrapping up the AXE storyline. This is very squarely a eternal story more than anything. Like a lot of this, I'm just going to throw this out here. I know we were very mixed negative on this event. It has been mm. strongest. But it is very clear that Kieran Gillen's interest most lies with the Eternals. And that's why, for me, this issue worked better than most of the event, to be frank. Well, and let me say, because um, I was uh, and on the last when we reviewed the last issue of, of the crossover, I was like, I'm looking forward to the Omega issue because I think that'll really restate where we are with all these different characters. And I read this and I was like, nope, still confused. Don't quite know what's happening with all of this. I mean, this was not enjoyable, but I think the ending was nice and sweet. I liked how it ended. I thought it was very uh, cool the way it ended um, and gave us hope. Because before, I felt like this just started and they were like, we're judging all you fucking humans, you pieces of shit, go fuck yourself. And this is a little bit more of the internals like interacting with humans and kind of uh, has a little bit more hope to the story, which I appreciated. But great art. I think the art was really fantastic. This... It definitely is a reset on all the yeah. eternal stuff. And yes. it repositions them in a, in a perhaps more interesting way. I just don't know. So much of the eternal storyline has been like palace intrigue. And this puts them much more as like servicing humans mm -hmm. and trying to take care of people so I, I don't know how that squares with the future of the eternals as a as a marvel project well i will say I, I agree with you on that just to call out some things that i liked in particular i think pete was hinting at this but there's a storyline with icarus and how he wants to handle the new status quo which i thought was very yep. good and very emotionally told and lo lovely in terms of the art and there's yeah. some stuff in terms of the machine of planet earth which we've talked about a lot feels like kieran gillen's voice is coming through planet earth there's a great little bit 
at the end of the issue that got some of that humor in there that I feel like was missing throughout the AXE event that I thought was very good. So I'm excited to read Eternals going forward, even if I didn't love everything that went on in this Judgment Day thing. Let's turn over to Wonder Woman yeah. 793 from DC Comics, written by Becky Cloonan and Michael W. Conrad and Jordi Belair, art by Emmalo, Emmalo, oh my God, Emanuela Lupacino and Paulina Ganeshow. This is taking a step away from the main storyline, or at least it seems to be doing, as we bring together the Trinity to of Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman to head to the Justice League Watchtower on the moon and try to fix some stuff that's going on. Of course, some fights happen at the same time. I thought this was a delightful one-off that I have a feeling might actually pay off in the long term in some ways we're not expecting, but this is great. Uh, I agree. This was boy. there's a, such a great moment where the Trinity all like gets together and hugs. Yeah, at a point, which you just don't see those little sweet moments. Um, a couple other sort of funny things. Um, they steal uh, Martian Manhunter's chacos. Oh yeah, uh, which uh, of course don't... Batman knows where it is. Exactly, Batman knows where everyone hides their snacks. Looking forward to that epic Grant Morrison crossover where Batman has the secret snack um uh facts on everybody and i i knew that martian manhunter was up to something when he's busted by wonder woman and his excuse is i've been doing renovations Mm -hmm. and uh, here's the thing you can ask the property brothers so i think alex said it coming up as guests on the show um (laughs) you don't do no one just secretly does renovations everyone's very like oh i'm doing braggy about the renovations i'm doing so tired this week i'm doing renovations uh, anyways, yeah, back to the comic. I, I think this this was. I was like, talking. Uh, I was actually talking about the comic. Uh, it seemed like you were just bragging. About I was talking about renovations. You, yeah, you do renovations. It's great. No, You're, but Martian Manhunter is in. It's in the comic, and he says he's been doing renovations, but he's lying. Okay, he, cool. Yeah. So, anyways, just was I feel, talking. There's an upcoming I, crossover from DC from Grant Morrison called Final Renovations. Okay, oh, right. it's gonna be really good. The anyways, last and, renovations on the Hall of Justice. Anyways, Sick. back to the back to this comic. I think what's nice is you know you we get a lot of like uh, Superman, Batman being friends, and they're so close, and they have like these kind of like bromance moments. But to have Wonder Woman kind of in the middle of it, also enjoying the kind of uh, hug thing, it was a you know it was really just sweet and enjoyable, and it was such a nice kind of change of pace where it was like this baseball X-Men issue, but it was a little bit more heartwarming. You know what I mean? It wasn't just like a down day. I really appreciated. I the don't understand people. Moments. You always have to put something down when you're lifting something up. Can't you just be positive about something? You just know? enjoy it. For a change. Okay. It's a good, it's a good point. I'll take that note. I, like I just only think the it, three of us could hug in a certain sort of Trinity in the same way. I, I just think it's one of those things where it was it was very enjoyable and super <laughs> sweet and the art was great and uh, I don't know what's happening anymore. But I did uh, I did very much enjoy this issue. Uh, definitely, if you want to feel uh, all warm inside, check this out. <laughs> I really thought you were going to say, if you want to wow. feel alive, read this issue. First time in a while. I feel so alive. Yes. Two Graves, number one, from Image Comics, written by jean via Valentine, art by Ming Doyle and Addie Wu. This is something that slowly unfolds throughout the book, so if you don't want any spoilers or come in clean, don't listen now. But essentially, it's about a woman who is traveling around with what seems like the specter of death, potentially. She is heading towards her own death, but along the way, she is taking some people with her. Of course, this comes from the uh, maxim, I guess you would call it the, if you're, what is it? If uh, you're going to take revenge, dig two graves. Yeah. 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 If you're seeking revenge, uh, dig, go ahead and dig. That's not quite right either, but it's, it's. Hey, uh, why don't you go ahead and dig? If you're courting revenge, you you might as well dig two graves. Yeah, there you go. So that's where it comes from. Uh, I thought this was great. This was very dreamlike. This felt like something out of the Sandman line of books in a certain way, Mm. while being disconnected. But I thought this was really good, and I was really intrigued by the premise, particularly by the end of the book. I'm curious to see where this goes. Yeah, I agree. I think it's it's beautiful. It's really well done. I, I like the pace of this uh, comic. It's kind of taking its time and enjoying what's happening. Um, yeah, I felt like it 
was also very interesting like in the beginning when she kind of took a fistful of dirt and ate it and i was just kind of like what the fuck uh mm-hmm. but you've been so hungry i have but uh i, I haven't uh gone to that uh, that depth of things but i i like the I way i would go clay if i had the had to choose hmm. interesting um Anyways, I I feel like the uh, it was a great reveal and, and made a lot of sense later. Um, also, I like what it's setting up. The tension that it builds is also really good. I felt like this was just a very confident comic that really believed in its idea, and uh, it uh, did such a great job telling the story, and the art really led the way. Uh, yeah, I agree. Great art. Um, the sort of reveal at the end, I thought was like something I didn't see coming. Um, and the mythological underpinnings to this story, because it felt like a specter of death, like you were saying, Alex. But going forward, it feels like maybe it's like Hades, the the mm-hmm. Greek uh, uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, commander of death? <laughs> Is that God. Uh, ruler God. of uh Greek god but it was like the his purview was death um i looked up the confucius at the quote it's from confucius seek revenge and you should dig two graves and confucius never one to not explain his joke ends with <laughs> one for yourself <laughs> <laughs> so just, just if you're confused about the two just graves you have uh, one is for yeah, the yeah, yeah it's for not you, like yeah, two yeah, people yeah, 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 two separate people that i'm gonna bury yeah, because it might be confused where it's like, oh, you're mad at somebody? Well, you better kill them and their friend. <laughs> <laughs> Dig two grapes. That's how you get them back twice. <laughs> Make sure to take their head for the body. That's how you take care of vampires. Confucius Vampire Hunter. I just came up with a million dollar property. Sabretooth. Oh, write it down, oh, my man. Wow. <laughs> Sabretooth and the Exiles, number one from Marvel, written by Victor Laval, art by Leonard Kirk. In this issue, Sabretooth has escaped from mutant hell and is being chased by the other folks that he was trapped in mutant hell with. Do they have to team up by the end? I don't know. You've read the title of the book. <laughs> yeah, there's a strong ampersand in there that makes you feel like they're going to be buddies. Yep. Um, the thing with this book is it, when you um, bring up the term exiles, I want to see some multiverse traveling. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, do, it feels like maybe we're not going to get there, but maybe we also will. Um, mm-hmm. The villain in this, uh, Dr. Barrington, if I remember correctly, is fucked up. I mean, we read a lot of comics, especially like set in the Marvel yeah. and DC universes. This villain was very, just uh, so very intense. Up. I just, really I was like, torturing. every additional step, I was like, yo, cool oh, yeah. with this. And uh, the poor nameless henchmen who had to point out that they were nameless. Um, so just, uh, just so I understand what, what happened in this comic. Um, so this evil doctor who loves torturing people was like, yo, I'm going to get Sabretooth and then clone him. But now it's kind of like a different version of Sabretooth. And then no. there's also Sabretooth. No. No, okay. Not, not at all. Help so me out. Cause it seemed she... like there was a lady Sabretooth that was cloned from Sabretooth. No, the lady is didn't... an entirely different thing that she created that she's been working on that she's trying to build like, this super maniac soldier type thing. So the it's just weird thing, that happens to look like a saber tooth female version. That's just something that blonde. I did in my head. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. They're, but I, I hear you, Pete. They're, they're of similar um, size and shape. But yeah. The real focus is on the liver. Also, yeah. Yes. Needed some of that sweet. She really wants to look. understand the human liver. And in order to do that, of course, you have to take out saber liver, which regenerates. That's basically what she's trying to do there. Um, but I let me to, to take up oh, Pete's yeah. to take up Pete's baton. Sorry, Alex, real quick. No, um, the part of the story that I was like, "What is the other exiles get to this island?" And they're like, "This island's fucked up. It's a mass grave." And they're like, "There's the doctor's ship." So the doctor kills mutants to experiment on them. He kills them, steals their organs and stuff, and then she flies her ship to an island where she dumps the bodies and then takes off and flies away. Yeah, I was like, that's a very bad plan. Uh, it's <laughs> definitely doesn't make it's, any sense. It's not a great plan. It's it, very gross and it's very over the top. I will say I love Leonard Kirk's art. So I was very excited to see him on yeah. here. And as usual, he just Agreed. writes, draws great superhero stuff. Really good. Very classic, very action driven and dynamic. So that was very good to see. 
Let's move from one cat to another and talk about Wildcats, number one, from DC Comics, <gasps> written by Matthew Rosenberg. Art by... Oh, uh, there it is. Uh, art by Steven Segovia. This is, of course, bringing back the classic Wildcats team, which... I'll tell you what, I did not realize they escaped from the deceased universe and came to the main DC universe and are now operating here just under the noses of the main superheroes. Justin, I feel like you had to be a Wildcats fan back in the day. So what did you think about this book? Uh, Huge. And uh, Matthew Rosenberg has been hyping this book up on his social medias uh, for quite some time. And I do think this book delivered. Um, it uh, it gave us the classic vibe of Wildcats, um, while also sort of scooping up um, some of the continuity of stuff that has happened since the original launch. It had the energy of that first book. It really took me back to the '90s, reading that first issue of Wildcats, where I was like, I don't know what uh, covert action teams have to do with two alien races battling over earth's uh dominant for dominance for generations but the fact that it's all here i'm loving it and rosenberg does a great job of sort of scooping all that up and making it um a thing while still being the dc universe because the stuff that took me out of it a little bit was like oh yeah green arrows here too oh come on that was fun when that happened it's fun, um, and I know I know they are part of the DC universe, but I just want to see this story pop on its own. I don't need a lot of intrusion. It was funny when Nightwing showed up. I was like, "What the hell is all this mess?" Yeah. That stuff is fun and feels like a punchline to a joke. But I, I would rather this story just gets to go and be its own thing without having a ton of intrusion from the um, rest of the continuity. Uh, I I just think that this was a really fun Wildcats book. Uh, I think they did a great job as a first issue, bringing these guys back, being like, hey, remember Grifter's kind of a dick. Uh, I I feel like this did such a great job of setting things up, getting you excited for more, and such an amazing kind of like last panel, you know, spoilers, them kind of crashing into a a court of owls meeting. I I just, I was, I read this and was very excited, and I felt like they did an amazing job. Also, tight bananas art. There you go. Yeah. Tight bananas. Pretty ch- tar- chill beans. Chill beans. <laughs> chill beans. Tight bananas. There we go. Let's move on and talk about Skull Kickers. Super special number one from Image Comics, written by Jim Zub, art by Edwin Hong. If you haven't checked out the series, first of all, do go back and check it out. It is one of the most delightfully hilarious fantasy series that has ever been printed in the comic book form. But this is bringing back together our angry but very happy dwarf guy our large dude with a large gun and a red-haired elf i believe who sometimes fights them and sometimes helps them yeah and this issue they essentially all go to hogwarts uh this is great i feel like this did not miss a beat from the last time they did this title and it was so much fun revisiting skull kickers once again yeah, agreed. Do you get a lot of bang for your buck here? This is a little bigger issue, and uh, it really delivers. Great art. Zubhub really delivers on the uh, uh, the story here. I really love the beard ending. It's hysterical and fun. Mm. Uh, yeah, I feel like they did a great job of uh, capturing what we know and love from, uh, from Skull Kickers and then putting them in this fun little adventure. You, uh, not to jump in front of Justin, I'm just very surprised because you sound a little muted to me, Pete, about it. I thought you'd be losing your mind about having your favorite dwarf dude back on the comic book page again. Well, yeah, I mean, I I said he was hysterical. It was really fun. I mean, you know, I... Uh, I don't know. What... I have a question. So when you call Jim's up Zub Hub, is that based on Stub Hub? <laughs> I thought it was sure. based on Grub Hub. Oh. <laughs> Do you not know? <laughs> Do you not know why you said that? <laughs> wow. It was just something we started saying. I thought it w- we were talking about a con. And we? we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when we were at the... Um, 
we were out. What, what, which what was it? The Philadelphia Con? Yeah, it was we a Keystone Comic Con. I think you yeah, started calling Keystone him Comic-Con. Subhub. I don't know. If both of us started yeah. calling him Subhub. That was the one that you brought all the knives. I to. wasn't even there, so I yeah. definitely didn't start calling. Yeah, just him real Subhub. quick. That was the convention that you brought a bunch of knives and drugs oh, to Jesus. in your backpack, right? Is that correct? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was, was a one of those accident, bag, if exactly, I remember correctly. Accidental thing like, oh crap, we're going through a metal detector. Oh uh, boy, you know, freaking I had all out these knives bit, and yeah. drugs, and I can't believe somebody. And it was also the up. time that I got addicted to Fourth Street cookies and uh, <laughs> missed a couple meals and became <laughs> oh, addicted right. to their cookies. No, yeah, that's, if we, you if guys remember correctly. Those cookies. You couldn't do the show yeah. because you ate too much yeah. cookies. I stopped eating cookies. regular food and was only eating those cookies. Yeah, and I got really sick. <laughs> that is, is shocking any positive association with that whatsoever justin what did you think about this comic book <laughs> um i thought it was fun i thought to put it um these characters in sort of the harry potter hogwarts universe i think is a fun uh, fun move and was able to let them be themselves and also just trash everything in in a fun way um so and this is the kind of book that i wish was just running like, mm-hmm. I, I wish they were just doing this on the reg rather than having it be a, a standalone because I want to see the overarching uh, takedown of all of our mythologies um, that are so popular now, especially we got we got Game of Thrones popping, we've got Lord of the Rings, like there's a whole world for them to mess up. Um, so I, I think this should be an ongoing, not just a special. Totally agree. Moving on to Spider-Man number two from Marvel, written by Dan Slott, art by Mark Bagley. This is continuing the end of the Spider-Verse storyline that has had Peter Parker and the straggling remnants of the Spider-Verse teaming up with none other than Morlin, the vampire dude, or whatever he is. And they yeah, are He's like a spider vampire. Yeah, he's like a spider vampire. He is... They are fighting against this wasp lady that wants to turn everybody into wasps for her hive. And they are traveling through the Spider-Verse, so they do that. And spoiler here, but the initial sacrifice, the first Spider-Man that dies or gets turned into a wasp right at the beginning here is none other than Tom Holland. Tom Holland gets turned into Aww. It's very clearly the bummer. MCU Spider-Man. A real bummer. Rip Tom Holland. I hope Zendaya is doing okay. I hope she's found somebody mm-hmm. new. Well, they're, they, I believe they don't know each other currently, Alex. So I don't oh, think that's right, a right, concern right, right, for right, Zendaya. Right, 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 right. Okay. So, yeah. like, because if you remember the end of the most recent movie, they sort of like have no. Um, let me just use my yeah. hands to show you. They have no relationship to each other. Just like <laughs> not at all. They're just in the same donut shop, but not talking. They are ghosts to each other. Yeah, yeah, which makes a lot of sense with everything. That... Which I feel like is normal and is totally cool. Yeah, it was such a great choice to end a movie on. I really appreciated it. Probably well, all so three good. of us agree. That's great. Yeah, it's uh, fun to see Dan Slott uh, on Spider-Man here. His uh, joke where, like, uh, the kind of, like, monsters jump out at him. He says, Peter Tingle instead of Spider-Sense. Like, I think that was such a fun uh you know thing that dan slot's humor comes through here and and we got a little spider ham so even the artist is having fun i felt like this was a very cool very classic kind of dan slot uh uh event i, I laughed uh, uh i guffawed i was like oh look at that that's cool uh, you know i had a good time a i'm laugh. just happy he's not collecting my tears right now and drinking them for his enjoyment oh he will drink those tears especially now that he got a laugh and a guffaw out of Pete. that's almost a hat trick he needs a chortle, <laughs> and he's got the whole thing. Uh, the um, this felt like uh, it's for, especially for a second issue. I feel like this story is going really hard, um, especially where it ends up. Um, and also, it felt like he took he's taking Spider Verse and truly stepping it up and out from all the um, everything that's come before. All the Spider Verse characters are here plus a bunch more that are uh, subtle changes to different things. And then it's uh, they've been turned against each other because of the um, waspiness. And I'll tell you, I I think we talked about this with the first issue. I don't love Moreland. Moreland is one of my least favorite Spider-Man villains. It just does not work for me necessarily with Spider-Man. But I am 100% completely a sucker for the trope of, whew, that's the worst villain that hero has ever faced. But you know what? there's an even worse villain. So they have to team up with the worst villain he's ever faced in order to take down this villain. That's exactly what they're doing here. 
it gets me every yeah. single time. And that's the thing. I'm like, all right, I don't like Moreland, but I'm 100% on board for this. So let's go. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. And also very sad. And you're going to drink your tears. Next up, Nice House on the Lake, number 11 from DC Comics, oh, written by James Town of the Fourth, art by Alvaro Martinez Bueno. We had a huge turn JT4. in the last issue where everybody yeah. got their memories back from this end of the world scenario. They know what's going on. And also the protections in the house got shut down so that these survivors now can actually die. So we've had a lot of the information that's been bubbling in the background for the past 10 issues is finally out there. Everybody pretty much knows everything, but not everything. But now we as readers know a lot more. This is definitely getting to it in a very exciting way. It, yeah, go ahead, Justin. The next issue is the last. To be hmm. concluded, we get at the end, which I thought it, I thought it was more. I guess I was foolish to think that maybe since we're coming up on twelve. But um, this this storyline feels like it. So much happens, but also um, so little happens in a good way. Where the characters are just we're getting time with each of them and uh, hearing them and feeling them react to everything as they're in this trap this like horror thriller movie trap that they've been in from the very beginning and it's been slowly unfurling the on every onion layer is being peeled off for individual characters at different times and i've now we're finally getting sort of the final confrontation where they're seeing the person uh that has brought them here yeah too fucking scary man all right fair enough. Let's see, what do you know you don't like houses or lakes or uh, being it, nice. Do you not like being nice? Is that the mm. problem? Well, I, you know, I think I think we all agreed that Lake House, you know, scarred us all. You know what I mean? So going mm. back there in such a horrifying way is the just, movie Lake House. Yeah, yeah. Well, the very you idea know, of sending different. letters to everybody uh, is terrifying, and the idea that they might not get them until two years in the past—it's <sighs> like something just walked over my grave. I think this is it. There are multiple houses on different lakes, and I don't. I'm curious if the because we just haven't one, really encountered the one. mailbox here, yeah. so it might uh, be a different mailbox. Issue twelve. Stay tuned to issue twelve, and I think we're the magic mailbox is going to be there. Keanu Reeves is going to show up. Sandra Bullock. Good. Save the day. There Let me go. ask you this: Was it just the mailbox was magical? It was like a postal service thing, or was it the it whole was, uh, situation? I think it was just the mailbox. I don't no, think the house. Was no, magical. it wasn't just the mailbox. Remember when the dog walked by and there was footprints on the thing that he saw it wasn't just the mailbox guys come on sorry i've never seen this yeah, quote i've unquote actually film. never seen this movie oh my, oh my God. <laughs> yes. just one of those cultural things that seeped into the consciousness do a power bomb number exactly. six from image comics by daniel warren come Johnson. On! i feel like we're definitely gonna have to put a spoiler Ooh! warning here because pete's gonna lose his mind otherwise but we left off the last issue with our multiversal wrestling match ending with our main two characters, a father and a daughter who are trying to bring their mother slash wife back to life through winning this match. Lost. Another team won. Lost. They beat I couldn't them. believe it yeah, was that a it wild there. twist. And there's several more wild twists here oh. leading to an ending of the book that made me cackle oh, with oh glee. My God. Uh, Pete, take it away. All right, all right, all right. Just this unbelievable story of a of a father and a, a daughter who are wrestling to to bring their mother back to life uh we find so out far, these this other people I already said I, go ahead yeah that's true it's true <laughs> but i'm saying in a way that isn't douchey and so oh. <laughs> the uh, the other uh we got the backstory of the other people who also are, have a good reason for their fight but they turn on each other because of the wants so you think it's over you think the match is done but it's not over okay it's uh, uh they end up spoilers killing each other so the fact that they get another opportunity and then you think okay great they're going to do it but then the reveal i just i lost my mind the the, the 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 character designs are unbelievable the fact that they're wrestling god to at the end of this was just insane and i thought maybe you'd be like a long-haired jesus kind of god you know what i mean but mm. like they're going for like a super jacked 
uh, a wrestling god, uh, which is uh, such a fun, uh, different choice. Um, so, yeah, I was just, and I wonder if we're going to get like a face-off kind of reveal. I don't know what's going to happen, but man, just unbelievable. And also the heartbreaking fact of like now the daughter knows that she's wrestling with her father, which she kind of always did, but we didn't know that. It was such an amazing layer as well. The art is bananas tight. It's an unbelievable story. Uh, Daniel Warren Johnson, when he does stories, it's gonna pr- it's gonna pull at your heartstrings. There's gonna be unbelievable action, over the top choices. It's an unbelievable ride every time. This guy just delivers. You want an amazing comic? He's got you. You gotta check out his stuff. Always killing the game. Justin, over to good. you for, for the counterpoint. <laughs> uh, good book. The art was cool. Uh, no, I love this book also. I just don't want to step on Pete's toes at all oh, okay. because well. it's this book is amazing. It has so much emotion and heart. And uh, on top of that, the art is the the way that Daniel Warren Johnson draw it draws. It's just like no one else does it. The mm-hmm. amount of detail, like oriented stuff that still pops off the page. There's a, a page like I don't want to say uh, like six pages in of just like you see the huge wrestling stands behind and um uh the dad doing a move it's, it's a flashback it's when the, he oh, first the met flashback the mom, yeah when yeah. he's jumping off this balcony thing and it's just like unbelievably drawn um and it just all works together so well daniel warren johnson is just an absolute star yeah i i just love the uh, the greediness of his art there's like something to it it, it just uh it, it's it's really unique Great stuff. Pretty much a perfect comic book. Definitely pick it up. Next up, Star Wars The High Republic, number two from Marvel, written by Kevin Scott, art by Ario and Nindito. We... When we talked about the first issue of this book, this is a mystery involving some Jedi during the High Republic era. There was a big twist at the end there where one of the Jedi dies, and that kind of kicks us into this story. That's where we pick up here, and the twist is he's not dead. Uh, There's some other stuff going on, and there's some other non-magical stuff going on. Um, What did you think? I I think we were kind of mixed about the first issue, though enjoyed the twist at the end there. How do you feel it picked up with issue two? Justin? I I like this, um, our main Jedi. He seems like a real, I'm getting too old for this shit kind of Jedi. (laughs) Especially in the High Republic, where it's literally the beginning of all this stuff, so he should be pretty chill. Um, I, this comic gets a little bit bogged down in the details where there's so I, I said this about the first issue where like there are like a million factions who believe in the force and we st- we're still touching on a lot of them. But I, I want to follow this central mystery and these main our main characters as they're they're chasing down what's happening. And we, we start to get more of that. And I just want to keep that going. The other Jedi of other force stuff is interesting but i don't want it to overtake the details to overtake the actual character driven story uh i really like the flow of this i feel like uh i for me uh my i like this more than the first issue i got more into this i don't know if it was just like the rhythm or the pacing kind of felt like a good clip in this issue but i feel like they did a great job of handling all the action that was happening in this issue and then giving us little kind of blips of information while still kind of being focused on chasing this kind of like uh character down and getting to kind of what's going on so i i really thought this was a great issue uh type bananas art uh, this is, I feel like uh, getting going and starting to really get good. Uh, yeah, I'm really getting into it. Batman versus Robin. It's crazy that the term, the, the, sorry, the term tight bananas are, we, has now become so rote that we just flow past it. And now we moved on to cool, the coolest beans, I guess. Hmm. Batman vs. Robin, number three, from DC Comics, written by Mark Wade, art by Mahmoud Azrar. As you can tell from the title, it is Batman vs. Damian Wayne. Damian Wayne is working for Nezra, I believe is the name of the demonic villain who is controlling people. We find out this issue, there's an even bigger villain who is coming up against him. So things are going to get even worse before they get better. But the big thing in this issue, and big spoiler warning here, we found out previously in issue one, 
Alfred Pennyworth back alive. Huge deal. Very exciting. Batman's Butler, the, the story of Batman's Butler. Yeah, exactly. There you go. And issue two, we found out, actually, Alfred is evil. And in this issue, and this is the big spoiler warning here, Pete had to once again watch Alfred die for the second time in probably as many years, something like that. I certainly lost track of time, so I don't know how long it's been. But you got to watch Alfred die again. Pete, how are you feeling? Okay, so uh, all that aside, I I got real worried when I opened up this issue and the title card was the island, and I was like, oh, God, not you too, DC. Don't get on this whole fuck island thing. Like, why don't we just leave islands alone? Stop with all the islands. Um, not all islands are sexually active people. You're right, you're right. Not all islands. Um, so uh, I thought this was just such a great issue, though. I mean, uh, the uh, the art, I think we can all agree, is super tight bananas. And uh, I really loved all the action, the, the storyline. Uh, plus, you know, Justin, you had to love this. We were inside Batman's head oh, for yeah. a lot of this. Like him kind of like taking things down and kind of like going step by step was such an awesome uh, uh, pace and kind of like rhythm to this comic. I really loved the way this moved. The Alfred shit was heartbreaking as fuck again, but uh, I really felt like it worked with this issue and was kind of like, uh, you know, I I would think going into it like, oh, Pete's going to lose his mind. But uh, everything else in the comic had me in such a happy place that uh, it wasn't as soul crushing the second time around. Like I was ready to kind of let him go a little bit more in this. So, um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I thought this was a really really uh, uh well done comic i mean mark wade is like he's a comic book like polymath like he can do so much at the same time like yeah we've got um this great bat family story where batman's fighting the fam yeah we've got like alfred being simultaneously a bad guy but also getting all the emotional core out of the alfred batman relationship also bringing him back to life two issues ago and then he dies again here it's like how do you how did i fall for that but i yeah, did exactly <laughs> big time uh talia gets to be sort of a villain but sort of batman's like um uh, like long lost love in a way yeah, like yeah. it's just like there's just so much happening in this comic while also being just a knockdown drag out great uh fight comic book it's but also Mark dealing can do it all but dealing with Batman's shortcomings, you know what I mean? Like he's talking about his failures along this giant battle that he's working through. It's it's really impressive. Dark yeah. Ride, number two from Image Comics, written by Joshua Williamson, art by Andre Bresson. This takes place in a horror theme park that has some very terrifying demonic things happening below the surface. The first issue of this, I thought, was a phenomenal perfect first issue that really kicked it off like a great tv pilot now i'm feeling like given the second issue the first issue was almost like the cold open and now we're finally getting into it with the beat of the plot there's more setups in terms of cold what's up. going on yeah with what's different characters uh and it ends with one of the darkest images i've seen in a comic book yeah ever possibly dude is wow uh, I really, I could not believe how dark that was at the end. And I don't want to spoil it necessarily, but uh, it, this is phenomenal. This is like one of my favorite books that is coming out right now, even two issues in. Wow. Well, well first off, that last, like taking such an innocent line, and I'm spoiling, spoiling here, uh, you know, like, look, daddy, I'm helping and putting it like the worst evil twist. I was like, nope, fuck you. This is way too fucked up for me. But uh, it was the end of the issue, so it was already, and so it was a good time to walk away from it. But man, <laughs> uh, this comic is really, really messed up and dark. And in the beginning, what seems like fun ways of like, we're making fun of Disneyland, uh, but we're, we're saying you're worshiping the devil, but it's like Disneyland. But this gets even more fucked up. So it's a, it's a really impressive escalation from the first issue that uh gets a little too dark at the end that loses me but uh i'm gonna be maybe reading the third issue between my fingers uh because i'm gonna be so fucking scared between your fingers you say mm -hmm. um 
Joshua Williamson, like coming back. That's your um, boy. After, that's my guy. After Birthright, one of my favorite come comics on. last like decade. Uh, and to come back with another comic that I was like, oh, Devil Amusement Park. Okay, I'm curious. There's not um, a huge story inherent to that. And the the preview and the first issue felt very much like, uh, this is cool. And I was like, yes, but we don't know what the story is yet. And then this second issue really starts to turn the screws. We start to get a lot of details. And I, I love it. The, the reveal that we get sort of later on in the issue that there's a little bit more of an investigation happening here. There are different factions emerging. Um, this is fantastic. We don't know what the mystery, what the evil truly is here. And I'm looking forward to finding out what. This is great. Definitely pick it up. Next up, Wolverine number 27 from Marvel, written by Benjamin Percy, art by Juan Jose Rip. The end of the last issue was Wolverine had been captured by some people who were carving pieces off of him and selling them to the highest bidder. And Beast bidded on Can I Kill Wolverine? Things get even darker and more upsetting and weirder in this issue. Man, uh, not to keep going on dark stuff back to back, but I love this run. I don't know what is going on with Beast here, but it is kind of terrifying and kind of amazing at the same time. But as I mentioned with the last issue, I'm a complete sucker for Juan Jose Rip's art, and Benjamin Percy is definitely leading into his strong points, which is the biggest, grossest, goriest things that could possibly happen. I, I agree with you. Like, I'm like... Is this Dark Beast? Which seems like very obvious. So there's like dying his fur or something, but I don't know. It keeps being set up like it's just Beast and he's like, you know what? It makes a lot of sense from a, because he runs the sort of uh, Krakoa's intelligence operation. It's like, it makes sense for me to just kill people using Wolverine. And I'm like, this is not cool. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm curious how this is going to unfold. And it feels like because of the unsettled nature of the X-Men universe, maybe Beast is a dick. Like, Kelsey Grammer's sort of a dick, and he played the Beast. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, I don't know. It tracks, if we're using that. Um, Frasier? Uh, yeah, Frasier. This, this is a classic Periscope Down situation, I think, happening in this comic. Oh I think we're God, in a Periscope dude, Down on, situation. Mm-hmm. We'll, if we'll anyone knows what we're talking that. about, you are insane. You're an insane <laughs> guy. Yeah, don't, don't waste your time on Down Periscope. Um, and let me throw out there that I also like Wolverine CIA buddy who is he like that feels like there's some heart there like I, I, I like this what the fuck you know I'm glad that I didn't read this before we had Jordan D White on because I would have fucking what the fuck this is of course you like the Zelvin this is Beast being a puppet master for fucking Wolverine and just using him, just making him go all, on all these missions and then using him up and then just fucking murdering him at the end. What? Who, uh, hold, what? Who hates Wolverine this much? Why would you hate Wolverine? Like, I don't want to hate Beast, but now I hate Beast and I, it better be Dark Beast and not the regular Beast because I used to like Beast. Beast used to be my favorite character, but after reading this, I'm like, fuck you, Beast. Like, this is awful. This is an awful issue. This is a horrible idea, and I'm fucking furious about it because I was excited to read a Wolverine comic, and instead I got like, hey, Wolverine's just a shitty fucking puppet, and we use him however the fuck we want because I'm I'm fucking smarter than he is, so fuck him. I felt personally attacked, and I hated it. Let me throw this out at you and then we can move on. And I appreciate the rad here, but this is when superheroes are at their best is when they are at their lowest. I'm sorry, you, when they're torturing each other and using them? You can't get any lower for Wolverine than he is being thrown in a cave and forced to eat flower lions while Beast is holding his metallic skull that has been taken out of his head. Like that, that is the lowest point you can get from Wolverine. Even going to that transitory hell thing that he went to is probably not lower. Like that. Yeah. But here, Uh, I mean, lion meat though, tasty. No, no, fly flower. I'm, I'm glad you 
pointed that out. It's not regular lions. It's flower yeah, lions. Lion. So they it comes out tastier. of Kukoi. He's well, it's his marinated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The My the point being, lion. he is at his lowest point. How he gets out of this and how he powers out of this is what proves why Wolverine is a hero. Like, that's what we are going to watch and see. Whatever's going on with Beast. You don't know that. Oh, you think this is his status quo going forward for the next, the, your entire lifetime? It could be. Marvel loves torturing fans, so this could be fucking a whole fucking Spider-Man. You know I'm Jason. If they, for the next years 40 years, shit. fucking they years, 40 years of Wolverine trapped in a cave eating flower lions, I gotta respect that. That's dedication. I'd ask you, Pete, I'd ask you who hurt you, but I know the answer is Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't need to know. Don't need Why don't we answer. move on and talk about Superman, Son of Kal-El, number 17 from DC there Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Cian Torme and Rari Coleman. You, in you this... luckily had that be the next comic we talked about. Yeah, there we go. Well, Pete, talk about this book. We've had uh, Kal-El is back on Earth. He is bonding with John. And in this issue, John comes out to his father, even though his father kind of knew about it already. Pete, what'd you like about this book? This is just, uh, I mean, this book continues to be a banger. Every issue is just like uh, uh, heartwarming and beautiful and just such a lovely story. The son of Kal-El is, is I, I love what they're doing in this comic. It's really just exploring this father-son relationship in such a cool, interesting way. The son finding his own way and the dad who just loves him and is proud of him. I mean, every single issue of this has been absolutely fantastic. A super type bananas art, of course. Superman loves his son and nothing can change that. And it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful to hear uh, Superman kind of give his little... A speech and be like you know hey you know not that it's the same thing but kind of this is my experience and kind of what i went through which was such a cool perspective to have in that moment you know not to be like you know son i'm not trying to take your thunder but just to share i think yeah. it was such a nice uh such a great great cool thing and uh gosh i've just been eating this up it's it's been such a uh a nice kind of change of pace from all the kind of normal comics and all the kind of action kind of focused stuff, which is also great, but it's nice to have stuff like this that kind of takes the time and, and talks about love and uh, relationships. So it's, uh, it's, it's been super enjoyable. Um, I first off cried while reading this yeah. great, but, and not something that is unexpected reading this comic lately. Um, and the, the way that Tom Taylor has successfully flipped the script on this Superman book and all comics in general, where the sort of interpersonal relationships and the feelings uh, and emotions that these characters are going through is the foreground and the most dramatic and interesting and emotional part of the story, while the superhero uh, drama and fights and the the danger that is happening has been is still important, but it is truly like the B plot of this comic in a way that is unbelievable, super impressive. I'm hyper engaged by it. Like Red Sin feels like a great, terrifying villain, but still the most interesting part of this story was, uh, was Superman having to talk to his dad about what oh, happened yeah. while he was away in his personal life. And that is an unbelievable flip-flop that I don't think anyone could have predicted for this book. Great stuff. Next up, Kaya, number two. Wait, you, from... Aren't you going to, you don't, you don't want to talk? No, I, I saw I you wiping you something out of your eyes there. What? No, some just. I saw you wiping something out of your eyes there. I thought maybe it was a what little. Were you clear. crying because of our reviews? Yeah. <laughs> I just thought they were beautiful. And the way the two of you connected, uh, that to me really comes to the forefront of our reviews. There's a lot of fighting that goes on in the background, but when I see that, <laughs> I'll right tell you what, that's true, my man. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. Kaya number you two. You didn't like this issue? No, I love this issue. We have like 50 more comics to talk through. We've been talking for an hour and 10 minutes, so I'm trying to move it along a little bit. Kaya number two That's from insane. Image Comics. Well, you could at least say same and then move on instead of just not saying anything and we're just fucking dying to know if you... 
Okay. I thought, it, so. I thought it was great, but I would have liked it better if John, we saw John's skull at some point. That's what I'm trying to get at. Like, <laughs> it, <laughs> just holding it. Wow. He was just patting the wow. skull in the yeah, corner. Yeah, he was petting a skull. Yeah. I just feel like that's a good trope for comics. It's one of my favorite tropes. Pet the I'm skull. Like, yeah, Pet the skull. Kaya number two, he didn't eat any flower lions. It was a weird comic. Kaya number two (laughs) from Image Comics by Wes Craig. This is continuing an epic adventure through Lizard Lad or whatever is going on here. But I, even though I don't quite understand (laughs) this world yet because it is a new world that we're just starting to get into, Wes Craig's art continues to be phenomenal throughout. And I like this. I think we're getting into like the political underpinnings of this uh, lizard human uh, world and uh, going deep on something that the the main premise of this is like uh, older sister has to get her younger brother uh, to another place. And we get into a whole like some relationship stuff into this other uh, lizard society world. This is a fun book. Yeah, I just love how art forward this comic is. It's it's really unbelievable this world you get pulled into it's just so beautiful so well done uh so interesting yeah i don't know what's happening i don't know who these people are but i'm having a great time and i'm really worried about that one character who's just take 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 you know what i mean like it's like what the fuck man (laughs) captain america sentinel of liberty number six from marvel written by jackson lansing and colin kelly art by carmen carnero this is the final issue of this arc where Bucky and Captain America have been going up these new Ooh. villains who are actually the old original villains who have been manipulating Captain America and Bucky since the very beginning. In this issue, and this is spoilers here, but Bucky has shot the revolution, I believe it is, who's part of this organization, yeah. shot through Cap to get him. And Bucky did that in order to become the new revolution so he could take control of his own destiny. So this whole issue is basically one big fight scene between Bucky and Captain America. It is phenomenal from top to bottom. So good. And if these six issues were all they did on this series, this would already be a perfect Captain America run. What? But uh, I think aren't we getting um an, a seven more issues and oh a yeah no no they're still going on it's still continuing yeah. they're gonna have a whole crossover between this and the Sam Wilson book there's lots more to come but I just mean like these six issues I was blown away by this arc they crushed every single issue both from the writing and the art perspective I know I've said this a million times but this feels like the heyday of Ed Brubaker and it was Steve Epting who was working with him. Epting, right? yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I agree with that. This feels like a real return to Captain America prominence. And with Bucky Winter Soldier being like more of a villain here and like assuming a whole new role that feels like much more complicated than the Winter Soldier being just the straight up hero who um, is has a fraught love relationship with Black Widow, but is that that's on a back burner? He's been a little bit lost lately, and this puts him firmly in a like, oh no, something fucked up is coming position. Yeah, the uh, something fucked up co- is coming is that last panel there. That was crazy to see. Uh, I'm very nervous about what that means. But this was rough, man. This was not enjoyable to read because um, you don't uh, like when those guys fight. Yeah, I don't like when I see my parents fighting. You know what I mean? Like it's you would not... consider Bucky and Cap your parents. Uh, no, I'm just saying, like when two people who you don't want to fight love each other, you very have a much. lot invest. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. made and made you Bucky and Captain. America. Uh, let's <laughs> sexually oh by having God. sex. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> That's we, what you're saying, right? If you're no, listening no. to the podcast, you might not know this, but Pete it's has a... a metal arm <laughs> which he got from his dad, Bucky, <laughs> and he has a shield which he got from his mom. Steve Rogers. Uh, so it's a common saying, guys, when you say, I don't want to like this, I don't like it when my parents fight. And I'm not saying that they're I, my parents. I get that about my parents oh when I'm talking about my parents, but like, you're talking about two fictional uh, characters. Oh, Pete, look, he fro- <laughs> he's so sad. Right, he fro- and- well, this was, it, it's, it's heartbreaking to see this kind of happen. And uh, uh, what's happening with Bucky is heartbreaking. And that whole, thing was just uh, it was it was a lot and i didn't i didn't enjoy it well this comes back to what i was saying evil as other people 
this is what I was saying about the Wolverine book as well, and I think this is why I like it, and I understand this is why you, you bring don't that like back it, up. Pete. Uh, but this is sure challenging both of these characters. It's challenging their heroism. It's yeah. challenging their friendship. This is what's going on with Steve. Is what is he going to do now that Bucky is one sixth, I think, of one of the most powerful organizations in the entire world. Four, there's four of them. It seems like at the end of that five, table, there, maybe yeah. the points of the stars. I'm going to throw out there. But the five, five, uh, the and what's going to happen to Bucky? Like, is he undercover? Is there going to be a twist there? You know, there's going to be a lot more story to tell, and I'm really excited to follow it as we go. Speaking of which, who do you think you'll spend the holidays with, um, Bucky or Cap? Cap, bro, I'm team Cap, always have been. Okay, I don't know. Bucky has that shiny new arm, it has like a little bit of a rainbow thing going on. That was pretty cool. Dark Crisis, real quick on that though, real quick on that. In this comic, Bucky drops Cap by ejecting his arm. He's got a second arm just on the on the sneak tip. No, he's no, got, he's got, got like a because he's arm. a cool, powerful dude now. They gave him an even better arm. Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths, number six from DC Comics, written by Joshua Williamson, art by Daniel Sempere and Rafa Sandoval. In this issue, it is a brawl to end it all for the fate of the multiverse. It is everybody against Pariah. We are brawl getting... to end it all. Brawl to end it all. We are coming down to it here as every hero in the entire DC universe brings it to bear against Pariah and ultimately against Duststroke as well. What do you guys think about this? I mean, oh, the father-son double punch? I mean, come on. I mean, geez, that's that was just unbelievable. The action, is, there's a ton of great action in this. Type Bananas art, this is a lot of fun. Yeah, I agree. The art is very good. I liked the Superman, Superman stuff. Um, i curious, there, there seems to be some Green Arrow stuff that we're going to get to. I love the Black Canary here. I was surprised by the end. I was surprised that's where we're ending. We're leading into the final issue of this. I kind of wish that place, I wish we had gotten to that several issues back because it felt like that's where we're going anyway. And I'll throw out there, I do really like the art in here. Always like Joshua Williamson stuff. Also like him as a person. We'll follow yeah. his stuff, obviously. But this story simultaneously feels huge and small to me. The fact that like we're doing Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths but they're all fighting on one battlefield. This feels very much like a wrestling brawl to me that's going on here mm, with all of these heroes. Yeah. Do a power and, bomb. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily have the emotional hook of do a power bomb at the same time. That's what I'm kind of missing. Right. I, I want to see some scale going on if you're going to do this title and that I haven't necessarily gotten here. I think like there's a fun story of a bunch of dark versions of villains fighting a bunch of heroes but I don't quite get what the point is as of yet, but maybe we'll find out. We'll see. Mm. Radiant Black, number 19 from Image Comics, written by Kyle Higgins, art by Marcelo Costa. After a few standout odes done in one issues, we are back to the main story with our multiple Radiant Blacks and tying into Radiant Red, who is now going to prison. As always, I think this is a really good, solid issue of this new superhero universe. How do you guys feel? Yeah, this feels very much like full universe uh, is encapsulated. And I think this is the kickoff of the fourth volume. Um, so it's definitely much absorbing a lot that's come before and really um, pitching us forward into what's coming next. Um, this is, uh, we've said this from the jump, this is one of the most confidently started um, uh, comic book universes that we've seen in, in years. Yeah, I really like uh, what's happening here, how this is uh, moving forward. Uh, type bananas are really great story, kind of fun, uh, evil robot reveal. Uh, yeah, I, I think this continues to kick ass. Classic, fresh out of the refrigerator beans. Specs number <laughs> one for Boob Studios, written by David M. Boer, art by Chris Sheehan. In this issue, it posits, what if you ordered one of those magic glasses out of the back yeah. of a comic book, and it turned out they gave you wishes? What would happen then? And what if, in fact, they were very limited wishes at the same time? <laughs> How would that spin out? I didn't know what to expect for this book, but I ended up really digging it by the end, particularly because of the emotional bent between the two main characters. And this is a bit of a spoiler here, but it's two dudes who order these glasses. One of them is in love with the other and doesn't know how to tell him. Also doesn't say it explicitly yeah. at any point in the book, 
but it's pretty clear what's going on. And I like that emotional hook there. You have the power to make any wish. What if you hesitated from doing the one wish that you actually wanted? Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I like it for those same reasons. It's said a little bit in the past. Um, so I think that helps to explain some of the stuff you're talking about, Alex. And I think that really matches the art, which has sort of a Sean Lewis-esque take to it mm -hmm. um, that I would say. Um, and it, it does, the premise when you explain it feels a little wooly. It's a little like, yeah, there are glasses, but they're magic. But wishes and glasses have nothing to do with it. Uh, but uh, it's okay. Um, and so, but I, I do think that it's just an entryway into sort of the emotional storytelling here. Curious where we're going. Yeah, I agree. The story's a little mammoth, but I feel that like the thing is, it's like no. this is a fun premise, uh, well executed. Uh, I like the underpinnings of what's going on in the story. And good call on the Sean Lewis kind of feel to it. It's definitely typing in his art. Uh, but yeah, this is creative and fun, and uh, they do a great job of uh, getting you excited for what's to come. Mammoth Beans and Type It Out as Art. After School, number four from Image Comics, written by Leon Hendricks III, art by Eric Z Zawadzki. This is, I believe, the final issue of this Image Comics collection, which each issue tells a done in one dark sci fi or fantasy story. I've really enjoyed the first three issues of this. What did you guys think about the fourth one? I really like the premise of this series where it's like after school specials dealing with um, mm -hmm. the sort of teen drama situations, uh, PSAs style. Um, this one reminded me of, did you guys when you were in high school watch a video called The Wave? No, I don't think so. At all. It, it was about a very similar premise where like this, uh, college, uh, this uh, high school teacher is like, starts a club called The Wave as an experiment to show sort of how uh, people can become fascists very quickly. And um, it gets out of hand in a similar fashion. So this, and I felt like it was a purposeful um, uh, rhyming with that storyline uh, with a little bit more of a bloody horror take than this book, this uh, video that was shown in my high school <laughs> for some reason. Maybe it was made by a local, I don't know. Hmm. Um, but uh, I, I like this good, the art was cool. We saw sort of the troubles forming and then it gets worse. Yeah, I mean, they do a great job of heightening on kind of like a, a, a premise or idea. I, I like the the moral and what they're trying to say. So uh, I think this was really well executed and it was also, I think they did a job of kind of like hiding the fact that this guy really wasn't aware of uh, like how out of hand it had gotten. So I kind of appreciated that. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a reap what you sow type of thing. Uh, you know, I just felt bad that, you know, you know, poor mariachi bands and, and stuff like that kind of kind of got wrapped up in this kind of evil thing when it was well, just that's a, a hat. You know, that's what I was going to say. What do you think about the hats? The hat yeah. did definitely, of all of the it things. It was hard because I laughed every time I saw it and it was supposed to be, you know what I mean? If you haven't read this, the, 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 the teacher starts a club where like, and everyone in his, the high school gets on board, becomes like a gang uh, situation. But they all wear uh, mariachi style hats with little red balls hanging down. And I was like, that's a weird <laughs> choice of the symbol for this yeah. uh, sort of evil gang. It's definitely the least successful of the issues to be of after school. But Aww. like you were yes, saying, agree, I agree. Agree with that. It's still a fun issue to read. I like this series quite a bit, and I'd love to read a sequel if they want to do it. Next up, speaking of sequels, Billionaire Island, Cult of Dogs, number one from Ahoy Comics, written by Mark Russell, A.A. A. Rubin, and Carrie Harris. Art by Steve Pugh, Richard Williams, and Carol Lay. <laughs> this takes place in a near future where billionaires run the world and all hang out on an island together. That island got, I believe, destroyed at the end of the first series, and here yes. we're picking up with one billionaire billionaire who has inherited basically the remaining gigantic corporations on earth the lois lane style character that's tried to track him down and the one billionaire dog that they're all trying to get as usual with mark russell mark russell stuff this is ludicrously satirical i enjoyed this Ludic quite a bit uh i had a fun time 
Yeah, I agree. I think it's uh, creatively impressive and it's got a fun story that is trying to tell uh, the whole kind of like Wi-Fi weird dude with the hat thing was very amusing. I, I like what it's saying. I like what it's uh, trying to say. Uh, I feel like this was super enjoyable and the art's typing as. Uh, great satire, scary, uh, also funny, a great combination. Yep. Got to find out where this business dog is. There you go. Three Keys, number two from Image Comics by David Messina. In this issue, we're picking up the story of a bunch of folks who work with tiger men to fight evil monsters. I was pretty iffy and down on the first issue while you guys were a little bit up. Now that we're into the second issue, how are you feeling about it? Well, I mean, we should ask you since you were the one that was down. I felt um, better about it. I okay, good. No. I, the only thing I, I, I didn't love was... was the Big Bang Theory cameo that happened at really? Saint Mark's comic. The middle, don't like that show. Not don't love. Dude, being yeah, Ramon but they Jones. were throwing references all over the place. There was, you yeah, know, know. A Douglas Adams reference. There those was guys, like, so many different are references. Fake nerds. Fake wow. nerds. Gatekeeping. Yeah, and, well, I, I'll gatekeep them. I'll do it. Well, and and no, let me say dude. there there's a little bit of fake nerd energy here, where there's a lot of stereotypical takes flying around, and that I agree is my sort of least favorite part of the book. Um, but I do like uh, the art. I think is good, and I'm curious what the overarching story. I wish it's a little surfacey. It's a little fratty. I wanted to get a little deeper with the story. Uh, yeah, I guess I, you know, as maybe the least deep person on this podcast. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I thought I, liked the, I, I love the over the ness of it all. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of what I thought was fun references. Um, yeah, I mean, why not? You know, so uh, yeah, the the arts are very action forward. So yes, please. This is a fun comic. All right, so that's one bazinga from Pete and no bazingas from me and Justin. Got it. All right, why don't we move on to Minor Threats, number three from Dark Horse Comics, written by Patton Oswald and Jordan Bloom, art by Scott Hepburn. This is the third issue of this book about a bunch of minor supervillains who are running around their city trying to find the big supervillain who killed the Superman-style character in this universe before the heroes of the universe end up killing them or throwing them in jail. Each issue has focused on a different member of the team. Here we're focusing on the scalpel, somebody who can see inside of people's bodies and digging deep into her backstory. This is this comic, I think, gets better every issue, frankly. And I don't know if you guys feel yeah. the same. I agree with you. And it's there's a lot going on. It's a complex yeah. comic because there's a lot of plot happening. At the same time, we're getting a very specific perspective of a sort of main character all the characters it's very ensemble but the pl main story is sort of driven by uh, the main character so it's weird to keep jumping perspectives um but i like this world i like how comic booky it is how there's a whole section of town that is time displaced and they walk through it like the characters in um inside out i think mm -hmm. uh it reminded me of that uh and when they walk through the um the abstract area. Um, but this is a fun read. Every, every issue so far keeps getting better. Like you're saying, Alex. Yeah, I agree. It, it's doing a nice job of like, uh, getting better with each issue. Um, yeah, I, I think this is, there's a lot jam packed. I almost feel a little bit overloaded with everything going on, but I appreciate the layering, the layering of it all. Um, yeah. Arts type bananas. This is a very enjoyable book that is building nicely. Uh, with each issue, uh, definitely worth checking out. I do want to give a shout out in particular to Scott Hepburn uh, working lettering into the art in this issue throughout because yes. that's kind of how Scalpel sees the world. It's really beautiful to look at and it's a really interesting layout. So if you're looking for a new superhero universe, this is definitely one to check out. Love Everlasting, number four from Image Comics, written by Tom King, L Art by Elsa Charterrier. This is, I definitely mispronounced that, but this is following a woman who seems to be jumping through different romance books. And when she finally achieves love, she dies and ends up in another book. There's a mystery going on in the back, and she seems to be slowly learning over time or maybe not necessarily. What do you guys think about this one? Uh, Justin, I believe you were big ups. I love this in particular. Big ups. I love the way that Tom King is able to 
simultaneously tell sort of these stories that he wants to tell, um, while also looping that up into this larger take on romance books and relationships in general, how I, I feel like the comment I took away from this is that we're all, all of our relationships or all of the way that we love is like the way that we do that. And maybe the relationship changes or the situation changes, but it's still the same romance novel to us as people, as the specifics change and we're resetting each time. And to sort of put that larger lay on, and I'm not saying that's true or what everyone else thinks, but to have that, to have, to read this and have that larger idea while also just reading a story, a great story about a World War II relationship that is tragic and um, interesting uh, at the same time and have it be all drawn in the style of a romance comic. So many layers. Tom King just continues to showcase that he's a master of, of comic books. Yeah, I agree with Justin. You got to loop it up. And uh, if you're stuck in a loop, it better be a romance loop. Uh, but I, I, I this a is... A zombie loop. No, no. Uh, I, I feel like this is, uh, this is heartbreaking. And so far, I'm not enjoying getting my heart broken at the end of it. So I'm hoping for a better tomorrow. But uh, type in Anna's art, and this is uh, definitely a, a lot of fun so, so far. Last but not least, Shock Shop. Number three from Dark Horse Comics, written by Cullen Bunn, art by Danny Luckert and Lila Lays. This is two stories that we've been following over the course of these issues with a Crypt Keeper style narrator. The first story is essentially the thing on a camping trip. And the second story is a bunch of imaginary characters who just go out and kill people. Uh, they're great. I really like the art in here. These are spooky and scary. And even though we're past the Halloween time, I'm still really enjoying this book. I'm glad they're tying it up with the next issue that gives it a really finite feel to it. But I really think this is one of the strongest things that I've read from Cullen Bunn in a good long while. And he's a pretty strong writer anyway. It feels like big horror. Like it felt like a small story at first and then has branched out into this sort of like big blockbuster style, uh, bloody monster horror, which I think is uh, a fun surprise. Yeah, the kind of uh, it, I enjoyed the story, but the horror really freaked me out. I mean, there's just some really scary, as Justin saying, bloody kind of. Uh, body more really creepy shit going on so i didn't enjoy that but the story is intense and good and as far as scary stuff goes this kind of checks all the boxes um i was sure as shit freaked out so uh well done and the bun does does love kind of a horror monster kind of feel the so does uh, love. yeah so uh the bun's on it all right. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. If you'd like to support us, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast and YouTube. Come hang out. We'd love to talk to you about the bun. Or really anything. <laughs> Exclusively Apple, the bun. Exclusively the bun. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Comic Book Live on Twitter, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you in the woods where we're having sex with a witch. Oh, come on, <laughs> man. As long as it's not a swamp. <laughs> That's what he meant. He meant a swamp, no, the sexy woods. Swamp. I did do this.